All right, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to the AMSSM uh, National Fellows Online Lecture Series. Uh, glad to have you. Thanks for spending uh, uh, some time with us tonight, whether live or asynchronously. And uh, we are pleased to have uh, Dr. Jesse DeLuca, who's uh, both a friend and a colleague of mine, and uh, very lucky to have him uh, to teach us today on sports pharmacology. Um, we're going to go ahead and advance the slide. This is the National Fellows Online Lecture Series. As you know, this has been put on by the AMSSM uh, Education Committee and the Fellowship Committee and uh, has been uh, uh, very useful both for fellows and for, uh, you know, attending physicians to, uh, to keep up their, their currency in these topics. This is not intended to replace any of your, your individual fellowship programs, educational content. This is simply a supplement and to give you access to some of the uh, national level experts that we have in, in a variety of formats and uh, sometimes panels and so forth uh, to assist you in the end with CAQ preparation. Uh, please do uh, keep your uh, microphone muted, uh, keep your video off, it helps with the bandwidth and um, uh, you can submit questions through the chat function in Zoom. Uh, if you wanna include your name and program, that's great. Um, I will be asking the questions at the end as, um, as Dr. DeLuca finishes his lecture um, for a live Q&A. Uh, we'll do about 10 minutes of that at the end. Uh, we, we do send out an evaluation that uh, comes from uh, Andy Meyer. And uh, while we're on that, a big thank you to Andy for making these happen. Uh, he is the one that facilitates and just really, uh, you know, keeps this show going. So without him, none of this would be possible. And I uh, really do want to thank Andy uh, for his hard work and, and time away from his family in the evenings to make these happen. Okay, um, next slide there. Uh, do want to announce our next lecture. We're going to take a pause from these, uh, this series over the holidays, um, but we will resume on uh, Wednesday, January 3rd, uh, 8.30 p.m. usual time uh, with a talk by uh, Dr. Ben Nwachukwu on uh, hip impingement, femoracetabular impingement. Dr. Uh, Myra Liu will be uh, moderating that. So we encourage you to mark that on your calendar and dial in. <laughs> Without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Luca. Um, he is uh, one of our faculty at the military's fellowship program, which is where I had the, the, the opportunity and the pleasure to work with him and uh, also to learn from him when I was a fellow. So I um, appreciate him uh, coming on. He is a uh, family medicine and sports medicine trained physician and currently serves as the chief of clinical pharmacology at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Uh, he also wears uh, multiple other hats, including a program director of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research slash USU um, Clinical Pharmacology Fellowship Program. So uh, he trains our, our military's fellows in clinical pharmacology uh, for, for tri-services. Um, he uh, is involved with mul multiple working groups, including combating antibiotic resistance and uh, pharmacogenomics. He's also heavily involved with research uh, in a variety of areas, including infectious disease, uh, brain health, performance optimization, and, uh, and other areas. Um, he uh, was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech, where he was a wrestler and uh, was on an Army uh, uh, ROTC scholarship. So uh, shout out to the Hokies if you're a Hokie out there. Um, and uh, he uh, went to medical school at Nova Southeastern, and uh, he's uh, served for many years in the, in the Army. He's currently a Lieutenant Colonel promotable, which means he's about to pin on 06, which is a big deal if you're not a uh, uh, a military member. So that's uh, uh, kudos to him. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. DeLuca. Thanks so much, Nate. Really appreciate you and Andy putting this together, um, AMSSM for the topic. Obviously a little biased opinion here about uh, sports pharmacology, but uh, I will take over here. There we go. Can you see my slides? Yep, we can. Okay, perfect. Let me see if I can kick everything else off here. There we go. Okay, so that's me. I left my email there for any questions. Definitely interested in um, you know discussing further 
things that uh, you may see, you know, clinically and have, um, you know, concerns about uh, when it comes down to pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and um, certainly, um, you know, research areas. So the material has been reviewed by Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. There's no objection to this presentation. However, all these views are mine. Um, don't confuse them with any views of the Department of the Army or the Department of Defense or the uh, government in general. I have no financial disclosures. So the learning objectives, I tried to stay true to this as a fellowship um, endeavor as far as education um, and definitely will uh, explain, although, you know, I've been given somewhat of a, of a open canvas, I will try to paint a picture um, for the fellows of what are some very important topics. It will not be all inclusive to everything that you will come across as far as pharmacotherapeutics, uh, but I'll certainly, uh, I hope, plant some seeds in there um, for things that you may want to, um, you know, go back and look at um, and, uh, you know, identify as uh, areas that you may uh, need to study more. So um, I also want to give a little bit to um, our other, you know, faculty and, and uh, other areas as far as understanding drug effects on exercise and exercise effects on drugs to help, you know, us clinically um, take care of our athletes and, and tailor pharmacotherapies. So when I think about this from a perspective of a mission of a sports medicine provider, obviously we are there to prevent, diagnose, treat, and cure illness and injury in athletes. Um, and those participating in exercise. Also, I look at this from a, you know, pharmacotherapeutics um, stance is that we're also there to give confidence um, that when we're using pharmacotherapies, we're going to do so in a way that, you know, tries to, uh, you know, we try to accomplish our primary mission, but also we try uh, as best as possible to reduce or mitigate um, some of the liabilities that medications have that may reduce performance. So that is my uh, philosophy, because I think that um, if you're not giving that to the athlete, then they may go somewhere else to find um, ways to enhance performance, which uh, we'll you know, then have to have uh, more talks about with the athlete as far as not using things that may be harmful for them. We're going to dive into definitions because may, you know many have not probably looked at these for a while since medical school. Um, clinical pharmacologists, that's physicians, pharmacists, scientists that evaluate and develop pharmaceutical agents. And then a lot of times look at um, agents that are already out on the market and uh, try to determine if there's new signals, which I think is very important when we think about um, how trials are done. They don't usually incorporate people that are actively exercising. Pharmacokinetics is basically how we take a drug and then how it's absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and eliminated in the body. What the body does to the drug is, is basically um, what pharmacokinetics is. Pharmacodynamics is the understanding of what a drug target relationship is or what the drug is doing in the body. Is it binding to the mu opioid receptor and causing its uh, um, effect there? Plasma serum concentration. So when we typically think of giving a drug in clinical practice, we think of a dose response relationship. Are we giving that higher level of amoxicillin because we think that the sinusitis will take a little longer to, to clear, so we give that higher dose um, versus a lower dose that we may be able to get away with with uh, some other ailment? And from a pharmacology pr perspective, we actually look at this from a concentration um, response. So the concentration in that central compartment or the blood is what we relate everything back to. So just to plant that seed for uh, later on in the talk. Two things we look at as far as exposure is area under the curve, which is total dose expo exposure to the drug. And then maximum concentration is that peak um, concentration, which will is very important when we think about things like caffeine. Bioavailability, uh, amount of drug in the body, comparing IV dosing to other forms. So if I give something IV, that is considered 100% bioavailable. When I give it in some other form, PR, PO, sublingual, those are going to be a percentage of IV. And so we think about that as uh, bioavailability, what bioavailability are we getting? Bioequivalence, 
amount of drug in the body comparing one preparation to another. When a drug company decides to make a generic, they base it on uh, approval off of the fact that the new drug can actually match the old drug pharmacokinetics without having to go through all the same clinical trials. And that's how a, a, a drug is made. We also look at um, bioequivalence is, as far as fasting and fed state, which I think is another thing that's important for our athletes. Exercise and non-exercising would be another one that may change bioequivalence, which I'll talk about. First pass metabolism, I take a drug orally and it's going to go pass through the liver. And some of that may be, um, you know, may be lost due to metabolism. And so we look at that um, as far as first pass metabolism. Pharmacogenetics, genomics, just basically how our genes may affect our expression of metabolizing enzymes. Um, that's an area of personalized medicine, which we'll talk about. And then efficacy, just the success of the drug eliciting and wanting a certain outcome. Adverse drug reaction, uh, basically a side effect that can be unwanted or off-target response to a drug, such as um, if you think about caffeine, my on-target uh, efficacy would be alertness. If I take too much of it, it may be anxiety. Uh, my un that, that would be an unwanted uh, response. An off-target response is I drink caffeine and then I have to go to the bathroom in 20 minutes, right? Uh, variability, difference in efficacy or side effect events within a population. Um, I just want to throw that term out there uh, when I'm talking through this talk so you understand where, what I'm um, basically saying for variability. That can be affected by age, genetics, comorbidities, um, concomitant use of other medications, et cetera. So when I'm looking at pharmacokinetics, I'm gonna take a drug, I've got concentration on my y-axis, x, uh, on my x-axis is time. I This would be an example of anything other than IV, otherwise it would be just starting at the peak, immediate um, dosage into the you know central compartment or the um, blood that uh, would be around that Cmax. But for all other drugs, how you take it, usually have um, an absorption phase, and then a distribution phase throughout the body, and then a terminal elimination phase. The exposure I want is gonna happen somewhere around a certain concentration. If I go above that, I may get to a maximum response that I want, that wanted response, um, for example, alertness. And then if I go too high, I may have start to have side effect. So that's what we look at as far as exposure. Typically a drug is gonna come in, over time, you know, it's going to get absorbed and they're going to hit some peak and then go uh, go away. Drug development process. So I put this in here just to give a little um, example for, you know, why there may not be a lot of data out there specifically for our realm of exercise or participants, you know, people exercising with drugs on board. When we go into clinical trials, we look at normal people. You get phase one safety. That's usually 10, you know, in the number of tens, sometimes even less than that. For our phase twos, we get into a hundred, you know, hundred people or so, or in the hundreds. And then phase three, you get into the thousands. And then post-marketing surveillance can be in the millions. But still, what does that, you know, what does that say as far as exposure to actual athletes during exercise or even just, you know, people trying to exercise? So if you think about it from a injury uh, perspective, major athletic events, Rio, Tokyo, Beijing, they don't, they still don't have like a large number of actual illnesses that you would expect. Okay, I'm going to try to use certain medications. Or we're going to think about performance. So um, Rio, for instance, eleven thousand two hundred eighty-nine. It's five point four illnesses per hundred athletes, and maybe half of those were respiratory, so something around two hundred fifty. If they if they all received the same drug, would still be in a really low level of, um, you know, of a clinical trial to expose two hundred fifty people. Then wonder if there is some side effects that we're going to have, and it, could we extrapolate those side effects as a total when thinking about um, performance or performance liabilities. All right, so I will warm up everybody's mind here with a question on pharmacokinetics. It'll also tie in a few things um, that may be important as far as talking to athletes 
obviously there's been a lot um, out in the last two decades of maybe a little bit of less cigarette smoking in the populations of high school and in college students, but actually an increase in use of e-cigarettes, hookah, those things with um, water receptacles. And so I'll give you this uh, question here. I think I could, can I move this out of the way so I can read the question? All right. Coll collegiate athlete presents two month history of persistent cough in the off season, no sick contacts, no travel, but amidst the frequent the hookah bar, heard the harmful effects of smoking are cleaned out through the passing of through water, typical misconception. Uh, he also states that his friends also occasionally put alcohol in the water receptacle. What is false about water-based tobacco use and inhaled alcohol exposure? I'll go ahead and give you some time there on that. We'll give it about another 10 seconds. All right, good. I know I'm doing a, a good talk if we're across the board here a little bit. So something to consider when you're talking about, um, you know, nicotine use or even uh, nicotine, um, nicotine, you know, uh, vaping things where there's no nicotine involved, the tar exposure uh, being reduced is actually a false answer. Their tar exposure actually can be higher in the water-based receptacle um, you know, for smoking. Humidity in the vapor and inhalation practices typically result in a variable, but usually increased lung exposure to nicotine. That is true. Um, brain exposure to alcohol is increased. The, uh, and then inhaled alcohol is, is toxic to the lung tissue. So we'll move on. There we go. Okay. So um, increased tar exposure, like I said, actually, has been some studies that it's as high as a pack of cigarette smoking in um, one session. That can be because of some of the social value, but that um, the heating of the actual tobacco um, to very high levels that you wouldn't see actually in cigarettes is why that tar can increase. It does cause um, autonomic nervous system deregulation, peripheral vasoconstriction, reduced nitric oxide release, reduced heart rate variability. So that's something of concern if, um, if it's important to the athlete for gains and when to um, you know to do consecutive exercise, we have to think about that. When alcohol combined in the water receptacle, um, uh, brain exposure is much higher. So instead of taking alcohol the traditional way into the stomach, which is absorbed uh, almost 100%, but then goes through the liver and is actually broken down, can be reduced um, you know by 25% or even more um, through first pass metabolism. Instead, taking it into the lung you're going to get such so much higher exposure, it goes straight to the lung, into the heart, and then 30% is going to go to the brain, the other 70% to the rest of the body at rest. And so you're getting, instead of, you know, 25% reduction, um, and then only 30% of that going to the brain, you're getting the full amount, 30% going to the brain with alcohol. And so there's some animal studies out there um, that show that this is probably an increased risk of physical dependence. It can uh, basically mirror binge drinking um, from a you know single shot. And then nicotine and alcohol co-exposure are thought to be synergistic for dependence um, from either substance alone. Alcohol re also reduces innate immunity, which is something that we have to consider in our um, you know our long distance uh, aerobic type um, exercisers that they're um, you know that intensity of exercise can also reduce that as well. And so there'd be a um, additive effect. All right, question two. Which of the following NCAA substances bans depend on body fluid sample concentration levels? Creatine, cocaine, caffeine, and cannabinoids. I'll go ahead and give you some time on that. Give this one another 10 seconds as well. All right, fantastic. So a little tricky question there. Um, we were talking about NCAA uh, specifically, so we'll go through this. 
Okay. So as far as the bands, creatine's not banned. It is thought to be have some performance um, enhancement. I know we just previously had a lecture on uh, performance enhancing um, drugs. Uh, I think in the, in the past month, fantastic talk. Uh, cocaine, obviously, if there's any uh, finding of cocaine, that would definitely be a, a you know a ban and, and cause issue. Caffeine in the NCAA actually does have a fluid sample concentration in the urine that will um, that will cause a positive or is allowable. And so we'll go into that. Cannabinoids is a little bit of, uh, of a trick. The limit of quantitation to actually determine if cannabinoids is in the system, the NCAA has relaxed or at least raised the level. And so there's still a cutoff, um, but it is, uh, it, it's not the same as a, a level of detection like cocaine would be. So we'll go into these. All right, creatine monohydrate, so the PK, I think this is something uh, important for performance, definitely uh, um, at least something that you can see um, because it's so widely used that I, I would think that it would be uh, um, you know, testable on the boards how it, how it works. So clearance is about two grams per day or 1.7% of total body, body creatine in your you know, heavy uh, lifting athletes. Um, you know, you may see more, it can get up to even five grams per day of clearance. The performance benefits probably only when muscle becomes saturated. And so that's importance of understanding the loading dose. It could take five days, um, you know, or more to get, uh, an actual level into the muscles performance benefit, probably only while taking creatine, not necessarily after, um, there, you know, where that, where does that actually come from? Is it it? swelling of the muscle and increase of the pennate angle. I think that there's data out there on that, every, you know, everywhere from that to um, the actual, uh, you know, biochemical response of ATP is going to be used up in exercise in the first three seconds. Then you're going to have from three to 10 seconds, creatine supplying phosphate to um, AT, the ADP that's broken down. And then afterwards, you have glucose and glycogen storage, um, allowing you to exercise up to 10 minutes before having to start to, you know, go on to, uh, um, you know, fatty acid uh, breakdown. The uh, creatine is probably dual um, performance benefit in that it uh, allows for that phosphate transfer to the ADP, but then also builds up that glycogen storage as well. Total muscle creatine has higher AUC and sustained release or multiple dosing regimens for a single dose of equivalent amount. That's probably due to um, some models that are out there that show, you know, 50% absorption if you're at a lower um, dosage, 10 mg per kg versus 15% at 70 mg per kg. That was in a rat model. The um, dosages would be less in a uh, human model. So usually about, um, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, divided by 12 to you know, maybe 10. So other creatine salt formations uh, may increase absorption to muscle uh, utilization. There's, you know, dozens of different formulations out there, obviously, um, that are sold as supplements, creatine, hydrochloride, pyruvate, citrate is all out there. I remember when it first came out, you know, I was in, um, college uh when we're utilizing uh everybody's utilizing creatine and uh it was uh even then they were saying take it with um citric uh citrus fruits so that actually has probably panned out a little bit as far as uh, improvement in absorption all right caffeine not on the water ban list uh, but being watched always um ncaa bans for 50 micrograms per milliliter of urine that's, it states that that's the equivalent of around six cups of coffee right before competition. Their um, statement, I think, is around two to three hours. You would worry about it. However, caffeine probably peaks closer to um, you know one hour uh, between that one to two hour mark. Um, it does depend on if you're eating something. So, uh, but it's near 100% absorption. Uh, trend for improvement in short-term cognition for skilled events and short anaerobic. And there's been a trend towards improvement for aerobic fitness 
when you're adding it to rehydration fluids, probably not at the start of like a long race, but um, uh, somewhere, you know, in between that, that may be, um, there's some trend towards improvement there. It's metabolized by the CYP1A2 um, enzyme. It, you know, it's absorbed, only a little bit excreted in the urine. The rest gets metabolized, and then it is um, that metabolite is excreted. Caffeine's lipophilic, so it can get into like all the cells um, into the brain as well, and then you're metabolizing it so that you can turn it into a water soluble form and kick it out through the kidneys. Um, like I said, above 15 uh, micrograms per milliliter is positive. Um, C max is probably an hour. Half life is four hours, but that's variable um, in in different populations. The rate and temperature of consumption is likely not a factor. However, in pregnancy, could be even up as uh, as high as a half life of 12 hours with contraceptive use that actually um, lengthens the half time as half life as well. And so um, your your athletes taking contraceptives may um, you know may have a longer half life, and so that would mean that uh, it could it could stick around longer and then possibly change a, a positive test if they're taking a lot. Um, it also, um, the, there are poor metabolizers out there. So actually genetic, um, uh, genetically poor metabolizers that may also increase half-life to somewhere similar or about halfway between the four and 12 hours. Pharmodynamically, um, <laughs> it's adenosine receptor stimulation and an agonist of the Ryandine receptor. Cannabinoids, NCAA banned, but lenient, so not a detectability threshold, as I said, but there is an exposure threshold. WADA is prohibited in competition. Those are all products, natural or synthetic. Um, exception is cannabidiol. There was, um, you know, discussion in the um, uh, performance enhance enhancement, um, you know, talk previously. I say practice like you play. If you definitely can't use it in competition, then don't expose yourself to it. Um, you know, in the off season, when you're trying to make gains, the issue we've seen in the military is, um, you know, because of my position as to, you know, as a clinical pharmacologist is we get these questions every once in a while. Okay. We've had, um, a positive, uh, test for your analysis and, um, you know, what uh, I, I was, I was, uh, utilizing CBD or I think it was exposure from something that was contaminated, but it, for, for the perspective, for my perspective is even if we found it in the, you know, the product as a contamination, I still can't guarantee, guarantee anybody that you didn't also take it from somewhere else. And so a positive in the, you know, in a, a contaminated product doesn't, you know, necessarily clear you. All right. So we're going to um, move on here to pharmacokinetics and exercise. Uh, physiology at rest. So you got five liters of blood about in your system, maximum amount of oxygen removed from blood flow to the heart. Um, the uh, cardiac output, about a quarter of that goes to the liver, about a quarter of that goes to the kidneys, minimal blood flow to muscles and skin. You know, we all, um, you know, a lot of us are victim to a sedentary lifestyle. I can definitely say that it's a lot of times that I'm not getting any blood flow to the muscles. Um, gastric emptying time is around 20 minutes, small intestine transit time is six hours and then colon transit time somewhere around 30 hours or at least 24. When I acutely, um, start exercising that my adaptation will be, I still have five liters of blood. I'm still maximally taking out oxygen through my coronary arteries. However, I have a response. Those arteries open up and, um, that allows more oxygen to them, but 40% reduction in portal blood flow at even at 120 beats per minute, when I just get my, um, you know, uh, heart rate up just a little bit, I could probably do that driving sometimes. And so uh, at 20 minutes, I'm gonna get that 40% reduction. That's 40% of the blood that also is going to have drug in it is gonna be metabolized if it's a liver metabolized. 30% reduction in renal flow as well, um, at the, about the same 120 beats per minute. And then 30 to 50% increase in blood flow to muscles, that can be more. These are very conservative measures. Uh, 20 to 40% increase to the skin, especially in hot um, temperatures if I'm exercising. Gastric emptying time can slow. And then intestinal transit time uh, can be highly variable, uh, but slowing is probably worse with heat and hypohydrated state. 
better trained athletes will actually have a more more response, um, you know, more responsive system. And so these can be um, all even uh, worse. Albumin, however, blood proteins, um, that is probably not changed as much um, just because you don't have a lot of change in um, volume. That Maybe that changes a little bit if you're, you know, you're talking about a 50 mile run or something like that extreme um, where there may be some flux in um, amount of blood, but uh, uh, generally not, not seen as too much change. Clearance, I'll let you probably more read through this um, later if you want to, but um, exercise effect is probably not huge for the few drugs that have been tested out there for renal excretion. Um, there are exercise induced drug liabilities um, you know, through the liver, uh, is probably predominant. The, um, hepatic clearance determined by blood flow, unbound drug, and then intrinsic hepatic clearance, what the actual liver is going to do to the drug. Drugs and supplements with high intrinsic hepatic clearance, that means most of it's taken out when it passes through the liver, that's probably going to have a greater influence on, on blood flow. So going to the next. This is a interesting um, uh, study. There, there's a lot of these are kind of old, um, just because I think there's not as much push for um, these studies to be done. But um, you know, something to consider because we use this uh, physiologic-based pharmacokinetic modeling for other things um, when we're thinking about soldier health, and it can be extrapolated to exercise. But uh, these drugs were found in modeling to be, you know, high intrinsic. Um, uh, clearance, morphine, verapamil, propranolol, nitroglycerin. So bioequivalence, um, when thinking about, you know, this, uh, basically to say that you're bioequivalent to the same, to another compound, like if I'm making a generic or if I am have uh, a drug and I don't want it to have on the label that you have to eat food or you have to be fasting, then I want that drug to be within 80 to 125 percent of the concentration of the plasma, both in AUC and CMAX separately. Uh, that has to be determined. Um, one instance, really old, reaching back all the way to 1977, um, showing that if uh, just playing basketball, um, whether I'm, you know, taking drug, playing basketball versus at rest, the doxycycline dose can actually increase to the same or even above what would be considered you know, fed versus fasting. And of course, doxy, the tetracyclines in general have on their label, um, you know, uh, the, the fed or fasting determination. And then also, you know, don't drink it, don't take milk with. It. So question three. <laughs> We have a 17-year-old male soccer player with a hit to the chest and a chest pain developing over the next five minutes. No respiratory distress or other symptoms, but persistent mild pain. His pneumothorax was found via ultrasound or respective, uh, retrospectively seen on x-ray. Ultrasound's awesome. He received high flow O2 for six hours and was reevaluated with small reduction on ultrasound. Parents were supportive of home care and he was discharged with codeine. What is false about codeine use in this scenario? I'll go ahead and let you read those. Give it another 15 seconds. All right. Excellent. So I will close this. So the major cough suppressant effect of codeine is independent of the morphine effect. That is true. Codeine is actually not metabolized through the CYP3A4 pathway. It's through the CYP2D6. Codeine is contraindicated in this patient less than 18 years of age. That's a, a little bit of a trick. I like that um, people understand that those under 18 should not get codeine. It's not, it's not um, approved for 18 or less. It, uh, the FDA came out with guidelines that is completely contraindicated and those 12 and under 
um, for use just because of uh, this risk of um, CYP2D6 pathway metabolism. Um, codeine is, of course, the pro drug with very low, um, you know, uh, mu opioid uh, response, um, but is then uh, metabolized to the CYP2D6 pathway to morphine, um, and then can be further metabolized to either lesser or more potent um, uh, morphine equivalents. And then you have um, the codeine itself actually um, can be a, a, a cough suppressant independent. The um, it's definitely not recommended as contraindicated in patients less than 18 or from 12 to 18, that are either obese or undergoing um, a, a, a tonsillectomy. So those types of things, uh, the FDA has come out with uh, black box warnings for. And then respiratory response toleration decreases faster than pain relief toleration. I think that's important for um, opioids um, that knowledge that if you're taking a certain dose of opioid and then you stop and then you restart it, you know, maybe even as little as two to three days later, the same dose, your respiratory response toleration will actually may go back to normal, meaning that that um, level of opioid exposure can greatly decrease your respiratory uh, you know, can greatly decrease your uh, or cause respiratory depression. Whereas the pain relief probably is still going to be at the same tolerated ability. So you will maybe take more based on the fact you think you're not getting a pain relief. So a big problem for risk of overdose. All right. Um, very important on opioids. If you're not getting it on, uh, you know, sports medicine testing, you'll definitely see these uh, other places for, um, you know, just for licensing. Only use opioids after a combination of non-opioid pharmacotherapies and non-pharmacotherapies have been exhausted. And you should be using these in conjunction with um, any start of an opioid. Short-acting opioids should be used for the shortest duration at the lowest amount. I think gone are the days of, um, you know, giving tra tramadol for short-acting um, or for short uh, duration or, or actually acute injury. Everyone giving opioids should be evaluated for risk of misuse and, and abuse. If prescribing 50 mil equivalents or more, Narcan should be co-administered. That may be different depending on you know, where your hospital is and making about Narcan to everybody. Um, now that you know police officers and, and first responders are, are having these a lot more. Um, <laughs> there is... Um, you do have to understand that when I give Narcan, what I'm doing is I'm occupying uh, the mu receptor and the opioids still floating around. And the opioids half-life, you know, at the shortest is, is uh, you know, likely to be two hours, whereas the Narcan is much shorter than that. If you're getting a good response, the next step should really be to make sure that you have more Narcan available um, because it's going to eventually, um, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, get be uh, eliminated from the body. And then you're going to have, you know, still the opioid floating around. You'll have the same response again. So there's a scoping review here um, just recently uh, that I liked. So I wanted to add for um, positive or negative association with exercise. Exercise decrease opioid use. Um, Probably yes, but there's mixed results. And so, you know, can you use exercise in conjunction or exercise around the injury, um, which we've heard before, um, to reduce uh, the need for opioid. Higher level of sport, uh, more likely opioid use, misuse, yes, but there's probably caveats to that, that the higher level of athlete you are, the more likely that you have had you know, um, injuries or the more accumulation of injuries. And then there is higher abuse in college athletes for, for opioids. Um, just a note on pharmacogenomics, which I think is, um, you know, increasing in popularity and uh, certainly, um, you know, being, uh, you know, there's a lot of taskings going out to incorporate this or implement it into um, systems um, as far as like uh, EMRs and things like that. So uh, provide uh, providers are responsible, just like they would be prescribing a drug for a patient with an allergy. 
Um, the, the pharmacogenomic testing does stick around with you. However, it's probably more, you know, if it's on the FDA label, which there's about 260 drugs or more out there that have FDA labels of some mention of pharmacogenomics. And uh, results could guide to selecting a different drug or reduced issues by 50%. And so I think if we, you know, try to tailor these things to our athletes as much as possible, um, especially higher, higher level athletes, um, we may be able to reduce some variability, which could mean, you know, difference in, um, you know, difference in those needed seconds for, uh, you know, for, for particular events. There are websites out there besides just looking at the FDA, um, CPIC and PharmGKB. Um, to look at uh, specific drugs. So just like you'd search on WADA. All right, question four in our last question, um, which is false about COX inhibition. I think, you know, obviously NSAID is very important um, for us. Uh, we talk about it a lot in our, um, in, you know, in our, you know, biologics um, as well. So go ahead and give you some time for that one. <coughs> Give me another about 15 seconds. All right, awesome. So we're remembering our pathway here, I think, for the majority. So what, what's false about COX inhibition and side effects? So both non-selective and COX inhibition and selective COX-2 inhibition are risk factors for acute kidney injury. That's true. And if you're taking high levels of a COX-2, you can still get some COX-1 inhibition. So they don't block leukotrienes. That's down the opposite um, pathway. You would see that in you know steroid use. Um, they do block uh, thromboxanes uh, uh, to an extent. And then interstitial nephritis is an IgE-mediated um, NSAID-induced side effect. Topical NSAID is a first-line therapy for OA. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it's very rare that I see a patient um, uh, that, that is referred for OA that's actually taking this correctly. So, you know, lower extremity could be up to four times dosaging in a day. Um, for your topical, you don't want to go over 16 um, grams for a single joint or I think 32 for a day, um, but definitely something that uh, is going to peak in the system, you know, in the knee or wherever you're applying it to a much higher level with topical NSAID than if you were taking it orally. Um, and then the systemic effects is going to be much less as long as you're staying within that guideline as far as exposure. When I'm taking, taking an NSAID orally, I'm getting a real high level in my system so that I can penetrate um, into the joint and to get, uh, you know, a level where it's going to actually cause, um, you know, pain reduction. So um, SNRIs, uh, number to, needed to treat is probably about two to three, which for NSAIDs is about two. So that is a correct statement as well. The... Um, I think we probably are underutilizing that for, you know, chronic pain. Um, you know, the um, efficacy for um, an SNRI is, uh, is going to be actually at a dosage that can be even around half or 75% of what you would typically use for other reasons, such as depression. So, all right. And that's our, our pathway there. Um, you know, just steroids going to block everything at arachidonic acid, um, production, and then, uh, your NSAID is going to, you know, typically block just the COX-1 or COX-2. So. All right. Other examples of exercise effects on drugs. There's a lot out there, but maybe some that you'd more commonly, uh, utilize of so migraine prevention. Um, you have some choices, none of them particularly great for thinking about, um, you know, their, uh, 
you know, their effect on what is this going to do to your athlete or if they're even, you know, banned um, in, in that sport. So beta blockers, metoprolol and atenolol, both beta one selective, metoprolol metabolized through the liver, atenolol is eliminated through the kidneys. And so you have risk of, um, as we stated, you know, P2 antagonism at higher exposure and then um, decrease in lipolysis and potential uh, bronchoconstriction if you, if you had um, high dosing. And so, you know, if I'm going through the liver and I'm exercising, um, when I'm taking that, then uh, the metoprolol may be at a, a much higher level because it's not going to be metabolized as much with that reduction in um, liver flow. So pyruvate may, may be um, a little bit uh, better of a choice, although there's some variability uh, present in long, longer acting formulations. So, Other examples of drug effects <laughs> for exercise. So metformin, use in the setting of exercise. I think this has been on uh, the WADA list um, previously. I'm not sure if it is uh, currently, but um, thought to potentially have some um, performance um, enhancement due to the fact that you uh, may improve glycogen. This is seen at uh, altitude um, as far as the biomarker in this particular study. Um, there was some improvement, but not statistically significant. So. So one thing to consider, beta blockers, um, use of the setting of archery, kind of the same thing. Obviously, these are um, not going to be uh, allowed in those types of uh, precision sports where, um, you know, calmness wins. So reduced heart rate, but actually um, seen in some studies uh, like this one not to have a score improvement. Insulin, I think this is, you know, high yield for a couple of questions. Um, you know, to, to be seen and certainly important, you'll get out there and you'll have, you know, that one athlete that is uh, type one dependent. And so if I'm exercising, if I'm thinking about exercise and I have a 250 milligrams per deciliter or above, um, glucose, then, uh, you know, with ketones, then that would be, um, a reason to not exercise right then to actually get that sugar back under control because the cortisol uh, burst that I'm going to see in my first five to 10 minutes of exercise could put me at a higher glucose um, concentration and, and cause uh, risk. 300 milligrams per deciliter um, without ketones um, is, is also a cutoff point. Dose location for insulin, if you're exercising or considering exercise and you have uh, injected into the thigh, that may increase the blood flow to the muscle during exercise. Probably not as much in the delt. Um, abdomen is actually minimal, so those would be safer places to inject. Dosing amount um, is dependent on the variations in the um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And so level of training plus your level of stress and your length of exercise would be considerations to think about um, as far as how much insulin to give. A little note on heart rate variability. I, you know, I think, you know, looking at the data is probably pretty good information if I'm thinking of consecutive exercise bouts to determine how I'm responding to, you know, my, my rest phase. Um, but there are, you know, potential for negative and positive effects that may occur post-exercise where I don't know if it's um, by itself could be really seen as like how hard I trained. So the um, heart rate variability can decrease with certain drugs uh, that have anticholinergic effects, so um, TCAs. Um, that would be something to consider if you're using heart rate variability, um, you know, as a guide for um, your your uh, exercise intensity. Drug supplements, you know, just a, a quick note on that. I know we're um, getting close to time. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, I think, you know, high yield that's been out there, uh, St. John's wort, contraindicated interactions, and anti antivirals, warfarin, uh, metformin, sulfonylureas, sulfur, uh, sulfur moderate increased risk of uh, hypoglycemia. There is uh, grapefruit juice, which is awesome probably for reducing, you know, cancer risk because it does uh, decrease CYP3A4 metabolism, uh, but CYP3A4 is a, um, you know, a, a very heavily utilized um, pathway for metabolism for a lot of drugs. Garlic supplements, so PG, that's a PGP inhibitor. Um, 
this is kind of a case, a couple of cases that we've had and it's been in um, toxicology lectures before. Uh, lopiramide, also mu agonist, but um, doesn't cross the blood brain barrier because it's pumped out from the PGP. Um, there were several um, overdoses due to taking that with cimetidine, which is a blocker of PGP, so that um, you know people that are trying to get an opioid high would utilize this. Interestingly, um, what else I saw looking at the, you know the caffeine information, um, curcumin, which is the stuff that makes the turmeric orange. Um, which is in there, you have, uh, it's a CYP1A2 inducer. That means it's going to help um, caffeine get metabolized faster. And so um, if you're you know, coming off of uh, turmeric, you have a high load of curc curcumin in that turmeric. It's very orange in color. Um, then you may uh, cause, if you're continuing to take the same amount of caffeine, you may cause a response where your caffeine would be, your level would be higher. So. All right. So in conclusion, um, I think, you know, for, from a fellowship perspective, um, you know, my guess at kind of high yield sports pharmacology that you're even going to come in contact with or be, um, you know, uh, look, look for strengths and commonalities on, um, you know, testing COX inhibition pathway, harms to the e-cigarettes, water NCAA related co uh, compounds like caffeine, CBD, THC, and then the opioid ep epidemic, certainly. I think things to review, practice related, um, you know, personalized medicine, uh, I think drug exercise interactions, which we just don't know that much about. I've given you a couple of those studies out there, but they were um, definitely old, um, you know, things to think about, you know, from, you know, we've thought about in, in the past from a military perspective, like, you know, what if I'm exercising and doxycycline is my um, drug for malaria prevention? You know, am I, is there a, at times during the day that I may, that that drug may be ineffective? And you think of, um, you know, Africa during the, uh, you know, height of the rainy season, I may get bit by, uh, you know, mosquito with malaria, you know, four times a day. So um, pharmacogenomics, you know, that's definitely um, growing in popularity. So it's things to consider for practice relation um, and then drug supplement interactions for sure. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, tons of information there. Lots of, uh, you know, organ systems and, you know, topics from uh, different drugs to uh, supplements and um, WADA and NCAA and so forth. Um, I am going to uh, go to Q&A now. I'm looking in the... Um, so... Uh, uh, I have uh, from Peter, uh, can you please repeat the NCAA stance on cannabinoids? And uh, you mentioned insulin can increase blood flow to the muscle. Is there any evidence of ergogenic benefits? So two questions there, NCAA stance on uh, cannabinoids and uh, can insulin uh, give you ergogenic effects? Yeah, so the last look um, on N NCAA, I believe that it's um, banned the um, there's some caveats to that. So the, um, reading through the guidelines, it looks like it's lenient. There is a cutoff for a positive test, but that cutoff seems to have been moved up to a little bit, a higher concentration, um, where it's not just like a detectable level, but something that, you know, um, would be seen as, uh, definitely you have been taking it versus maybe you've been exposed some, some other place. I'm not going to, um, talk for the NCAA, but that, that's my read of it. Um, there is a specific cutoff le level, um, for that. And then there is, um, if there's been a positive test result, then it is, uh, looks to be school-based, um, response to that positive and how much, um, uh, how many times you've been um, tested positive, the you know the stakes go up as far as your removal from um, you know from competing, and so um, that you know there there's some nuances there for sure. Um, CBD not banned um, by WADA, 
and that, you know, I still think that, you know, just looking at concerns for contaminants, um, you know, that, that, that can be problematic, as I stated, even if you have a positive contaminant, um, that's not necessarily saying that you didn't get um, THC for another exposure. So, um, and the question was for insulin. So, uh, insulin can be um, ergogenic as far as muscle bulk. Um, from uh, you know what what I've seen, um, there is uh, a lot more that goes into it though. Um, as far as what you, you know, what else you need to do as far as, you know, caloric intake and things like that to, to get that gain, but, um, by itself, uh, yes, it, it can be utilized in that way, but it's not going to make you run, you know, run faster or, or anything like that. It's going to, um, you know, more likely give you muscle bulk and potentially some strength, uh, increase the, um, yeah, the, and what I was stating was, you know, concerns is when you have that athlete with insulin. Um, and you're exercising, it depend, you know, you have to look at and think about where they're injecting it because that increased blood flow of the musculature can cause a, um, you know, uh, greater, uh, res you know, response or greater absorption um, from the muscle. So you get a, a peak sooner or um, something that's surprising to the athlete, which of course you don't want to have. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I, I've got a whole list here that I uh, probably won't have time to get through. But I, one of the questions that I wanted to run by you, Jesse, um, is uh, with the rise of ADHD prevalence, um, we're seeing a lot more amphetamines being used um, in you know, our young athletes. Um, do you have any concerns about that um, in sports? Um, and uh, potential for abuse or, um, uh, or side effects or risks to the athlete, as well as, um, any comments on balancing the, you know, reaching therapeutic effectiveness while minimizing side effects with those medications? Yeah, I think, um, you're, you're definitely right. You know, it's, it's out there stimulant use, um, you know, some, sometimes, and, and I think, you know, with our, uh, population as far as gaining weight over the years here in the U.S., um, things that allow us to uh, eat the same, stimulate our body, uh, you know, re reduce um, weight. The, you know, those all are always, I think, for for the time being, um, are going to be have the potential, um, you know, to to be abused. The um, the, the other thing is, though, I think, you know, with those truly diagnosed, um, you know, it's it's important to, um, you know, have a good open uh, resource as far as, you know, our, our sports medicine providers in general. A lot of times, um, you know, those those patients are not seeing anybody else except for, um, you know, for sports. And so getting the understanding of goals and how to correctly utilize those medications, I think is important, but um, yeah, certainly, you know, stimulants are an issue. And I think why, you know, correct, correctly, um, you know, have, uh, you know, bans on them and in, in, in competition. So. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I, I see one other question in the chat um, and that's about uh, off label uses of medications. And uh, 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 this individual is asking, uh, do you have any examples of uh, medications that, uh, that are commonly used off-label? Um, and they're wondering about, in particular, levothyroxine, if there are off-label uses for that. Yeah, great question. Um, certainly, I think, you know, we, we practice, um, you know, probably 50% on and 50% off-label, right? Because things are um, when they're, uh, you know, when drug companies set out to have a, um, you know, a drug approved, sometimes it's the easiest, easiest pathway forward. Um, I do a lot of work in antibiotics. And so in particular, um, my low bar for getting my drug approved, may be soft, uh, tissue infection or lung infection or urinary tract infection. Whereas I want it to be used in a you know more specific incidence, 
I'm getting it out there um, earlier with, you know, this one indication and then I can grow on that. So um, us as physicians, a lot of times we're, um, you know, un unknowingly providing that extra avenue by utilizing things off label. If you look at metformin, you know, for instance, you know, highly utilized medication, are we using it off label? Yeah, probably when we first diagnose somebody with, you know, pre-diabetes or, um, you know, first diagnosed with even diabetes and they're on metformin, the first six weeks, they're going to use it with exercise, but probably not that much afterwards, right? Um, and then, and metformin is actually labeled as to be utilized in conjunction with diet and exercise. So that would be technically considered off, off label use if they're only using it, um, you know, by itself and not doing the other two things that are needed. Um, as far as levothyroxine, I haven't personally seen that, um, as a use, but the idea is out there, um, especially, you know, if you take care of, uh, patients with, um, hypothyroid, their thought process is that. The, you know, 50 pound weight gain is from uh, hypothyroid where it's probably more five to 10. And so um, it's, I think it's somewhat of a stimulant effect as well. And the, you know, maybe that little bit of um, satiety as far as, uh, you know, decreased intake of food and things like that, maybe, um, maybe why they're using it. But I, I haven't seen that personally. That's a interesting um, concept. Certainly I've seen it, I think, utilized in general you know practice just for uh, weight reduction or at least conceptually used that way yeah that is interesting a lot of uh concepts there to unpack but yeah it is eye-opening to think about how uh how much of the medications we prescribe are actually off-label but it's just kind of the way we practice um but uh well, that's great. I, we are, um, you know, I've got um, other questions, but I think um, we are, we're getting low on time. What I will um, uh, maybe just throw one more your direction and, uh, and then we'll wrap up from there. Um, Jesse, what are your thoughts? Uh, so can you expound on, you mentioned uh, we're kind of moving away from tramadol. Um, can you just uh, expound on what are the problems we see with, with tramadol? when we're using it for like acute short-term pain relief? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit longer acting, right, than your other opioids. And I think the trend is the least amount of opioid um, when, we're, when we have to move to that for acute pain um, and, you know, the lowest dose, least amount of time, and then the shortest acting is going to be no static uh, adequate quit. The mm -hmm. interesting, obviously with tramadol, also you have a little bit of the serotonin response. And so can you get that same effect with, you know, an NSAID plus, um, you know, duloxetine or something like that, um, or, you know, try, you know, the, you know, other non-pharmacologic uh, things that you can utilize. Could you get that with the same, you know, uh, you know same, same thing as doing tramadol? Um, the, yeah, and it's definitely something that we, we've used in the past. Um, the, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, even after, um, there's some studies out there, even after mastectomy, um, which is uh, one of the most painful um, surgeries, you can give, you know, 30 days of an opioid or 10 days of an opioid, and there's still going to be some left in the bottle. And so conceptually, what the patient looks at, I think nowadays with the opioid epidemic, where it is, is I'm, I'm, my doctor gave me this uh, number of pills, I'm going to try to take as least as possible. And when you have 30 pills in your hand, you're going to say, okay, well, 26 is fine. I'll still have four left over. Whereas you have 10, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll only do, you know, six or, um, and still leave over the same amount. So anyway, yeah, as far as tramadol, just a little bit longer acting, um, you know, I think termed as an intermediate um, rather than, a, you know, long acting, but, you know, something I'd, I'd try to move as short as possible. Um, you know, for, for response. And a lot of times, you know, patients are trying to, I can't sleep because of the pain. And you just even give them a window of, of an hour to two hours um, with a shorter, shorter actor. I think you can, you can get them there. That's, that's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, 
Well, really good stuff. I um, I don't see any more questions coming in through the chat, but um, we're a little uh, past the hour mark, but um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. So uh, thank you again, uh, Jesse, for being on and uh, sharing your expertise. Uh, clearly, you've done uh, a lot of work and time and training in this area, and uh, it's an honor to, to have you on and sharing uh, all of that expertise with us and the rest of, uh, you know, our, our community. So uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Thanks to everyone for joining uh, tonight's talk and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Take care and uh, hope to see you next time. Yeah. Happy holidays and uh, have a great new year. Hey, yeah. Thank you.